Hey there, Dango Stu here. Today's video is about making battery leads and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. I've got another viewer t-shirt photo though before we get started. This one is John Reedy from good old Sydney town, but the photo is actually taken in Death Valley, so it's a pretty cool pic. So thanks for sending that in, John. I think it's really appropriate that we've got a viewer photo at the beginning of this video because a lot of the techniques I'm going to be using today were suggestions from viewers during the dual battery setup video. In that, I used some old wires and made some really dodgy leads because I was sort of focusing on the configuration of the battery switch and the dual battery setup. But today, however, we're going to show how to make a decent battery leads using those tips. Many of you will have seen the first version of this video, so sorry for the, the repost soon afterwards. But Comments pointed out a few things that obviously could have been done a bit differently, a bit better, and I don't think the original video kind of did justice to the viewer suggestions that were in it by trying to put them all together into one cable, which wasn't really the idea. I've been in this game long enough now to know that if you put up a video with a problem in it, then you're only going to be replying to the exact same comment for the next five years of your life, so I'm really doing this for me. So people pointed out that there actually is a bit of a NASA kind of best work practices type site. So I had a look at that and I must admit I was kind of quite flattered to realize that the NASA engineers haven't yet discovered my techniques. I thought in fairness though, it'd be good to sort of discuss some of the things that get talked about in the established wisdom anyway. Now the first thing I want to talk about is wire itself. Now this is standard automotive non-tinned wire and it's much cheaper than fully tinned marine wire. If you can afford it, buy fully tinned marine wire. If you can't, you can't. Now, from what I've been reading, surface corrosion on the outside of the copper along the wire doesn't actually have a massive effect on the overall resistance to lead. As long as the mating surfaces, wire to lug and then lug to battery, are actually good clean connections. I have seen people have a differing opinion to that, and maybe it's true, but I'd be curious to see what the actual degradation is over time particularly if it uh, is well sealed at both ends. But, you know, once again, it comes down to your budget. Other things I think are really important. This wire isn't super, super fine, but you can see here, it does have quite a few strands in it. The thing about Apple wires is they flex. The cable I was thinking of making for the original version of this video was just between two batteries that are strapped down next to each other. But, the battery lead going to the outward starter does flex a lot, and that's where having really fine strands in the wire works better. While we're on the subject of viewer tips, another really good suggestion I've had from multiple viewers actually, is to use the wires from a welder. And it is true, welders are designed to have quite a lot of flexibility, so they're quite fine wires. They're thick, they carry a huge current, but because you're holding the torch and moving it around, you don't want this stiff wire. They're also apparently have a very heat resistant shielding on them and everything. So in that sense, they are actually a really good cable. Now, although this wire is not tinned, tinning it before you crimp it, I now agree, is a pretty bad idea, you know? And I did a little bit of research into cold welding. The idea that if you press two similar metals hard enough, then the, they actually start to bond at a, an atomic level. I don't understand the full sort of chemistry behind it, but the idea is that two very clean, similar metals get pressed together, and apparently it's a process that happens over time. You can't actually force it to happen instantly, so you crimp it, let it go, and it actually gets better over time. And apparently makes a really, really good connection. So I guess that brings us to the original tip, which was Jimbo Gasoline's suggestion to use one of these hydraulic crimpers. And I can see now how a hydraulic crimper like this is a really good tool to have. Essentially what I've been reading is that a soldered connection is better than a badly crimped connection, but a really well crimped connection is actually best of all. They then go on to say that the only way you really get a good crimped connection is with clean surfaces and a good crimping tool. So for 30 odd dollars, I can now see why Jimbo is suggesting this, because I really think it is essential if you are gonna do crimped connections. Now, tinning and soldering is still a valid option, but it wasn't really right to demonstrate both as one cable. They really shouldn't be combined in that way. Now, I did a little bit of reading into this cold welding idea. Not a lot, I admit, because I don't have much time. But the general principle seems to be similar metals. Now, what I don't understand then, to be honest, 
is when you get your sort of commercial lugs that are kind of coated or whatever and copper wire, they're not the same metal. So whether they actually cold weld, I don't know. It's interesting. One of the points about not having sold on it to start with is that the connection will actually start to get looser if you've crimped it once you've tinned it. So I can see where putting this on, perhaps putting a single crimp closer to the edge, it then allows you to feed some solder in the front if you'd like to. But ideally, I'd like to sort of see that cold weld idea in action. The other possibility then is if you buy and can afford pre-tinned wire with individual strands of tinned, put it into a sort of tinned terminal connection, then crimp them, is it actually the tinning that chemically welds itself or cold welds? Someone can tell me, hopefully. This here is a standard commercial battery lead lug. You see them everywhere. So I'm quickly gonna crimp this onto this untinned wire. It's not commercially tinned, it has been tinned afterwards using this hydraulic crimper and we'll see how it goes. Once again, I'm gonna use the number 35 dies that go into this and we'll see how they go with this diameter. So this crimper that Jim was suggesting works in the way most hydraulic devices do. It's got a little lock off valve here. Once it's locked off, you can just sort of pump the handle and it brings the two dies together. And then when you're done, you just open the handle, the hydraulic press is released and you can take your cable out. So this time I've crimped it onto the bare wire and done a single crimp as close to the end here. If this was tin marine wire, I'd probably actually consider doing nothing. You get your tinned lugs, tin marine wire, crimp them under reasonable amount of hydraulic pressure, and you're probably actually done, other than the heat shrink we'll talk about later. The other argument is that we could use that torch to, fit, to heat this lug and then start feeding a bit of solder in from here. We really don't want to get solder, this is short enough, I can pull this insulation back, here because this is where we don't gain any advantage in the conductivity but we do start weakening the wires themselves. The other discussion was a bit about the use of flux and I think the important thing is yes flux helps solder flow run better it's year better but be careful to avoid acid-based fluxes like a brazing flux that kind of thing because you will start to damage this you're in a certain sort of moist salty environment so don't grab your old sort of plumbing brazing flux, use a non-acidic flux if you're gonna use it on these connections. The next thing I do is go through the original footage which is making the copper pipe lugs that uh, Fireship or Jack suggested. And I really like them. Now I really like the suggestion for a couple of reasons. One is because you don't have to use it. You know, if you'd rather go and buy a set of these for $5, great, makes a lot of sense, you know. But I think it's quite clever. I think it could get you out of trouble in a situation. You might have some pipe lying around, think you've got to make up some leads. Hey, I remember how you can do that. Now, as Jimbo correctly observed in the comments of the original video, that the video is really an attempt to show these ideas that people had put forth and that they weren't always designed to sort of go together. Now, my understanding with these copper ones, and Jack can correct me if I'm wrong, is that they were filling them with solder as opposed to crimping. My understanding also is that they were then dipping the entire lug into a pot of molten solder to tin it because the bare copper will get an oxide layer and if it's the one connecting to the battery, that oxide layer will add resistance and it'll degrade over time. So having said all that, I'll still show the original footage of making those because I think they're really cool and well worth knowing it's an option. So to make these lugs, I'm just going to cut about this much off the end of the pipe using a normal pipe cutter. To use these, you just wind it back a bit, slot it in, get the length we want, say about, yay. Then you just tighten until there's a bit of pressure, do a run round, tighten it a little bit more, go around, and just keep doing that until it's cut through. And that'll give you a nice square cut. This particular pipe cutter, I think I got from a plumbing store somewhere. So you can see here, we've roughly got the same length. Next thing I need is a bolt that just fits inside the tube like that, reasonably snugly. What it means is I can then go over to the vise and crimp this side together to make the lug end without having this whole side collapse completely. Depending on how closely you come up to the end of the bolt when you crimp it, 
will depend whether the copper actually tears in front of the bolt. If you look at the commercial ones, they've almost all got this little opening here. What I'll do is I'll crimp one where I'm crimping quite close to the end of the bolt and one where the bolt's further back out and I'll show you the different effects. I'm going to crimp about the depth of the jaws of this vise because that's about the size of the lug I want. In the case of this first one, I'll let the bolt go as far as it can down into the pipe and that way we'll get that little tear I was talking about. So you can see here, if you have the tip of the bolt very close to the point that you're squashing it at, you will get the copper to sort of tear like that. That can be advantageous if you want to actually put some solder afterwards in the front, but personally I think you're better off keeping that bolt a little bit further back so that it forms a bit of a slope and doesn't actually tear. To get the bolt out now, I'm just going to put a spanner on the end and wind it out. So this way, the original way, is a little bit more of a mirror of the commercial ones but your other option is to have the bolt further away and you sort of end up with this sort of shape. Choice is yours. Next thing I do is drill a nine millimeter hole through this flex section so that the lugs can go over those eight millimeter posts. Because they're pretty fiddly to hold and if the drill bit grabs, they'll spin. I'm just gonna put them in one of these little drill vices. Final step is I'm just going to put them on the grinding wheel to round them up a little bit. Here you can see the finished product compared to a commercial lug, so pretty similar in design really. If I was to solder a cable, and I've definitely owned some cables that were like this, and I've got to say they lasted forever. I remember transferring them to multiple outboards and kind of being amazed how well they worked. And what they were was simply tinning the wire, tinning the lug, which means cleaning it inside if you're making it or buying new ones. Putting it in and essentially just filling it with solder. Using a good little heat torch and just feeding solder till it's essentially overflowing. The little torch I used in the original video was actually enough to get 32 square millimetres of copper hot enough that I could actually feed solder onto it and melt it. But I'll show you the torch I prefer to use. It's only because I was out of oxygen that I didn't use it. These little torch sets aren't that cheap and you do tend to go through a fair bit of oxygen. This oxygen lasts about 10 minutes, so it's not a lot. I mean, that can be quite a few jobs, but it still goes pretty fast. And I think they're about $40 a bottle, so it's not cheap either. The torch you see me using more often is that big LPG one with a kind of aerating nozzle. It generates heaps of heat, but it's a big flame. I think it's too big for doing lux. The nozzle on this torch is quite fine though, so you can adjust the oxygen, get the temperature you want, and then get that lug really hot. So as you feed solder in, it gets liquid enough to really flow well, but because it's happening quickly, you don't get too much wicking up the wires. The problem with wicking up the wires is they become brittle. So if it is flexing at that point, they'll break. Now, even though an outboard moves, the connector at the outboard, the earth and the positive don't move. You know, they're locked onto the block, the cable goes a short distance, it's then locked onto another section and that's where it flexes. So given that, I don't think the wicking and the, the mechanical breakage is a huge issue, but something to be aware of. So the final suggestion when making battery leads was from Ron, and that was about using this dual wall heat shrink shoe. So we'll just go through the original footage for that as well. The final step in the process is to put some heat shrink on it. So this heat shrink I'm going to use came from another tip in a comment from Ron Powell saying to use this dual wall tube. The idea with this dual wall tube is the inner section is actually like a hot glue essentially, and then the outer sections are more regular heat shrink. So you get a really, really good adhesion and a good sealant, plus the sort of constriction you need to keep it all together. I'll cut a couple of lengths of this off and we'll use the heat gun to put it on. You can see here the glue sort of coming out from inside it. You can also see there it's a 16 millimeter heat shrink tube just in case you're ordering it online. That's going to give us a really good seal on those connectors, but unfortunately this double walled heat shrink or the dual wall heat shrink only comes in black. So what I'm going to do now is because it's a red lead, a positive lead I'm going to be using, I'm just going to put some garden variety red heat shrink over the top so it's really obvious whether it's a positive or a negative lead. 
This one is 16 mil diameter as well, but really noticeably thinner compared to the dual wall. Because the black stuff's already been shrunk down, should fit over the top easily. Here we have the finished product, hopefully a much better battery lead than the quick and dirty ones I made up in that dual battery setup video. So a really big thanks to Jim, Jack and Ron for their tips on making these. So hopefully that addresses most of the comments from the original video. I think it's good that people do comment like that. I also think it's really nice when they put it nicely. Thank you for that. Apologies for the double upload. I've done that recently with another channel as well. And it's just one of those things sometimes you go, nah, I can't let that slide. Let's just fix it. One thing I really don't say enough is how much I really appreciate all you guys subscribing to this channel. I've learned a lot through the period of these videos. I always hoped that it would be a bit of a conversation. I'm not an expert on all these subjects by any stretch of imagination. So it's really good to sort of show what I know and have people comment and say, oh, I do it this way, here's a better way. I also think this channel is really blessed with a set of subscribers who have a good sense of humor, lots of really good knowledge, and you know, really make an effort to contribute something back. So thank you very much for that. All right, well, that's it for today. Next week, I'm actually gonna look at some trailer stuff. People have been saying, you know, we don't do much trailer maintenance, and it is an important part of both. So I'm gonna have a look at some problems I've been having with jockey wheels on our trailers, and we'll go through maybe trying to install a grease nipple in there and stop some of the corrosion problems we've been having. So we'll give that a shot next week. All right, take care, and I'll see you soon. Bye. Oh, and don't forget, 11 a.m. 9th of December at Parsley Bay if you're gonna to come to our meetup. All right, see ya.